welcome to our last topic of exploration of the history of analytic philosophy. We are now turning to the rise of modal metaphysics. And I think the best way to understand the relationship between this rise of modal metaphysics and the history of analytic philosophy is, first, the history of analytic philosophy is predominantly empiricist, and empiricists in general are wary of talk about necessity and possibility, essential properties and accidental properties. That sounds like something difficult to glean from experience to tell which properties you have that are essential and which aren't, which claims about the world are necessary and which aren't. And as we've seen, the predominant strategy among empiricists is to think of necessity and possibility as deriving from facts about language, in particular, what's analytic and what's not. So what we're going to see in the rise of modal metaphysics are efforts to resist this empiricist paradigm. So our first discussion will be about conversations between Quine and Ruth Bark and Marcus. I'm focusing on Marcus for a couple of historical reasons. First, there was a controversy at an APA meeting in the 1990s, where I think his name is Quentin Smith at, he's at maybe Western Michigan or something like that, claimed that Kripke's ideas were not original, that he had stolen all of his ideas from Ruth Bark and Marcus. So there was a big controversy about it. The accusation went nowhere because Ruth Bark and Marcus was still alive and she poo-pooed the idea and said, yeah, there are similarities between what she had to say and what she was writing and what Kripke wrote, but it's not even remotely true that he plagiarized or stole her ideas. And Kripke never, Kripke isn't a political animal. He's not in the, he doesn't take this stuff seriously, sort of, sort of lives on his own independent of all of these things. So as far as I know, he never responded to the charges or had anything to say about them. So that's one motivation for studying her work. Take a look and see, does it look like all of Kripke's ideas can be found in Ruth Bark and Marcus's work? And the answer to that is very clearly no, though there are important overlaps between their interests and approaches. The second thing is Ruth Bark and Marcus is one of those super smart people who are daunting to read. So if you've read the piece already, I think you already have you will see all sorts of unusual things. Like instead of using a standard identity symbol, the equal sign, she decides to use a big capital I and subscript it, which makes um, interpreting her work even more difficult than it would be otherwise. The other thing is, um, and this goes to something to keep in mind when you write your papers, sometimes really super smart people talking to other super smart people don't pay attention to their intended audience or sometimes they don't have an appropriate intended audience. So think about the preface to uh, Wittgenstein's Tractatus. He says, this work is directed at maybe a couple of people in the world who've already thought through all of this stuff already. Now, if that's true, my response is, we'll send them a letter. You don't need to publish a book. If you're publishing a book, the whole idea of the word publish is to spread abroad, make readily available to a wide group of people. So if you intend to publish something, presumably you ought to be intending to make your ideas known a bit more widely than just by sending a letter to Russell and a separate one to Freya. So the whole idea of publishing is to have a larger group of people in mind, and you're trying to get your ideas made available to them in ways that are understandable. So you're supposed to think about that audience when you're writing. Take their perspective and try to speak to it. Um, Ruth Bark and Marcus doesn't do that either. She, for the most part, talks to Klein and to other people that have criticisms of this new interest in modal logic that is arising. Now, the work in modal logic began in the early 1900s, I think the uh, decade of the teens, when C.I. Lewis developed five modal systems. Um, there was no semantics for um, modal logic until 1962 when Saul Kripke published 
a semantics for quantified bundle logic. And without a semantics, you're sort of left in the dark. You have system uh, symbol manipulation that can occur based on the rules and the axioms for the systems. But um, you don't have a good sense of how all of the symbols connect up with notions of truth and falsity. And so you're not really quite sure which axioms should be embraced and which should not. You're not quite sure when a new proposed axiom goes further than what you really wanted to endorse. So for example, uh, Brouwer had an axiom that said, if it's, if it's possible that something is necessary, then it's true. So diamond box P, arrow P, anything possibly necessary is true. Well, that's a rather mysterious remark. Are, are you supposed to endorse that? What do you think? I look at it. I remember the first time I looked at it and I just had a question mark. It's just, I don't, I don't know what to make of this. Is it true? Is it not true? Well, once you get a semantics for quantified modal logic, you're then in a better position to think about the precise logical content, the precise semantic content of that claim. And then you'll be in a better position to determine whether it's true or not. That's the early part of the 20th century. You get a bunch of symbols, you get some logics, at least the syntactic part of the logics that are available. And not many people are doing much with it because remember, Russell was worried about the language of necessity and possibility and preferred not to use it at all. So when he characterized the domain of logic, he did not talk about the notion of logical consequence in the way that we do. We talk about the notion of logical consequence and the truth preserving character of standard first order monotonic logics. So we say, what we're looking for is an understanding of this connection between premises and conclusions where the conclusion can't be false in circumstances where the premises are true, but notice the notion of necessity or impossibility there. That's the standard account of a valid argument, one where the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises or one where the conclusion can't be false when the premises are true. That's not what Russell wanted to say because he didn't like, he was afraid of this language of necessity and possibility. So he said logic is a study of just the most general abstract features of reality. So there's empiricist resistance to the development of any logic that involves the language of necessity and possibility, except when that language can be interpreted in terms of a philosophy of language distinction, the distinction between analyticity and what synthes syntheticity, analytic and synthetic. That's a little easier to say. And that's what you see in Wittgenstein. In the Tractatus, Wittgenstein characterizes the notion of a tautology, invents the device of truth tables that we use regularly when teaching propositional logic, and then claims that all of necessity and possibility is nothing more than tautologies resulting from a properly constructed truth table. Now, his project at pulling that off did not succeed. He recognized it didn't su succeed. Frank Ramsey recognized it didn't succeed. But we still have this strong anti-modal metaphysics sentiment occurring. Now, skip forward past the Vienna Circle, past uh, the Carnapian project into the 1950s. So I guess skipping past the Carnapian project is a bit too far in the future because Carnap's major work was in 1962. But Carnap's idea was we need probability theory to be the underlying mathematical structure for understanding confirmation because we need a logical and objective notion. And his approach to probability theory relied on things that look an awful lot like what led to talk about possible worlds. So he talked about state descriptions. So if you have a language, take all of the atomic formulas of the language, all of the simplest sentences of the language that you can have and arrange them in a table. The table is going to be really big because there's lots and lots and lots of the simplest sentences in a language. But if you arrange them in a table, suppose there are n number of 
atomic formulas for your language, then the table of all possible combinations of those formulas will be two to the n, two to the power of n, where n is the number of formulas. And we go two to the n because there are two truth values. So you have this really big table giving you all possible combinations of truth values for the atomic formulas. And each line on the truth table will be what Carnap called a state description. Now, a state description at first glance looks like just one way the world might have been. It might be that your car is red, and let's suppose that's one of the atomic formulas. But your car might not have been red. So there's a line on the truth table where that sentence is true. There's a line where it's false. In fact, exactly half of the total lines on the big long truth table will be lines where your car is red comes out true and half where your car is red comes out false. Same for every other atomic formula. And then each line is what Carnap called a state description. And you might think, it's very natural to think, well, that's just a possible world, or at least the beginnings of a characterization of a possible world. And then if you go along with Wittgenstein, you think the truth value of every other claim about a world has to be a construction out of the commitments we make about the atomic formulas for the language. Um, that turns out to be difficult to sustain as well. But at least the idea of a state description is this is the initial stage for constructing a possible world. So you can think of if you if you let possible worlds, if you think of those as having to be complete so that they include for every proposition P, either P or its denial, if you think of completeness as essential to the notion of a world, then let's just define a scenario. A scenario is like a possible world, except it can be partial, right? So here's a scenario. Today is July 4th, 2046. Now, what else is true? Well, there, there are things implied by that sentence, and those things will have to be true as well. But notice nothing that I just said about that scenario makes a commitment on whether you'll have a car in that scenario, whether your car will be red or some other color, whether you're alive or not alive, whether I'm alive or not alive. Lots of stuff is left out. So it's an incomplete scenario, but that's, let's just use that language, scenarios in that way. So state descriptions are scenarios. And you start with scenarios, and if you add enough stuff, you'll reach a point of completion, perhaps, and then you'll have a possible world. Okay, so Carnap is doing something that looks a little bit like possible world semantics, although he doesn't talk about it that way, because remember, state descriptions are completely syntactic units. They're characterized solely in terms of the grammar for the language. Possible worlds, on the other hand, are semantic in character. Kripke called them indices, but they don't even show up until you get to the semantic side of the logical system. And remember, the proof theory is on one hand, logic falls into two parts. The syntax is composed of the rules of grammar, telling you when you have a grammatical sentence and when you don't, plus the proof rules, how to derive some formulas from other rules. The semantics on the other side links up with meaning and truth in some way or another. So the Carnapian thing was all on the syntax side and the Kripke stuff is all on the semantic side. Well, what happened to the Carnapian project? The idea that you could think about modality and things like that, and even probability, ran into Nelson Goodman in the 1950s with the Grub lean paradox. We're not going to talk about that because I think it's a small footnote. What it reveals is it's a small footnote in the history of analytic philosophy. At the time, it was huge because it completely undermined the Carnapian hope that you could get a purely syntactic notion, probabilities that could function in a theory of confirmation. Okay, that, that turned out to be essential to his understanding of the objectivity of confirmation. And it led him down a path toward a more pragmatic conception of things. And we've already seen some of that in the paper that you read by Carnap. What else was happening in the 1950s was that Arthur Pryor started working on temporal logics where you had operators such as it will be the case, 
it used to be the case, it is now the case, things like that. And there was a way of looking at these operators and linking them up with what C.I. Lewis was doing when he introduced modal logics back in the 19 teens. And that's, you have some stronger operators and some weaker operators, and you can define one of the operators in terms of the other. So the box operator for necessity, you can define as um, the dual of the diamond. So box means not diamond not. In English, that says if something is necessary, that's true if and only if, it's not possible that it's not true. Notice that mirrors the dual rule for quantifiers in first order logic. For all x, fx says there is no instance, there's no example of an individual that lacks the property f. That's not existential quantifier, not fx. So those are dual rules and it looked like temporal logics or as Pryor called them tense logics. First, the tense logics sound like you have to be a little hyper when you do them. And uh, second, it's just, it's part of this, it's kind of funny when you think about it, but this is part of this idea that what's fundamental to everything is language. We're interested in the connections between mind, world, and language. Yes, we are. And if you are doing analytic philosophy, you are starting from the language circle and trying to do everything from there. And so if you can do logic about time, time is a feature of the world, maybe a feature of any possible world, but in any case, it's a feature of our world. So you're interested in logics having to do with time. And your very first thought is, well, that means we got to pay attention to tense because we have to start with language, not with the world. Okay, so these developments are occurring, and then that led people to think, maybe there's something worth thinking about further in the logics that C.I. Lewis developed in the early part of the 20th century. And Ruth Barkin Marcus is one of the first to be thinking about this. Ruth spent her career at Yale University. She may have had small stints at other places, but she is associated most strongly with the Yale department. And the Yale department became a place in the 60s and 70s and probably into the 80s of discord. Strife and discord characterized the Yale department. It used to be a really fine department, and then it disintegrated in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, ceased being a very good philosophy department at all. It wasn't a good place to go to grad school. They've since recovered, and they're now a very fine department again, which is what you would expect. It's fitting for an institution, the quality of Yale, to have a very fine philosophy department. But in the background here is the Yale-Harvard pairing. These are rival schools and rival philosophy departments. So Ruth is at Yale. Quine, Goodman, Putnam, other people are at Harvard, but Quine is the major figure. Quine is the giant logician of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Well, at least through the 50s, probably into the 60s as well. He, part of his mystique in the eyes of philosophers at the time was that he knew more about logic than anybody. Now, that's not, that's not accurate, but that's, that's the way reputations work. Ruth Barkin Marcus is not surpassed by anybody when it comes to her understanding of logic. So let's look a little bit at the conversations and conflicts between Quine and Marcus on modal logic. We begin with Quine's critique of modal logic. Marcus begins her paper by talking about Leibniz's law and the problem of substitution. We will get to that later, but because the substitution problem is one of the things that Quine is going to bring up as a problem for modal logic. But Quine begins his critique by saying, you know, there's, there's really a problem with modal logic. It's, it's kind of like going down in the sewer, hoping to find a nice quality of life. That's just not the place to find it. So quit thinking about modal logic and go back to the ideal theory, which according to Quine is basically Fregean first order logic. So here's where Quine starts. He says, I'm going to explain to you why we shouldn't have done what we did at all with respect to modal logic. There is nothing to be learned here. 
So he says there are three grades of modal involvement. And on the surface, this looks insignificant, I guess is the right way to think it. Think about it. But look, there really are three different kinds of things being done. A does one thing. It says a certain sentence S is necessary. Now notice first, there are single quotes around S. So we are mentioning the sentence rather than using it. That means the sentence S is a sentence in a language and the language in which we're talking about S is a different language. So we are now, this is a sentence, A is a sentence in the meta language. That's a technical detail that turns out to matter to Klein. So don't say without single quotes here, S is necessary, just say, just mention the term, mention the sentence rather than using the sentence and ascribe to it the predicate is necessary. All right, so A is a metalinguistic sentence. That makes it different from B. B just puts a necessity operator on S. So notice that will be a sentence in the very same language in which S is formulated. It is an object language sentence. So A is a meta language sentence about S. B is an object language sentence that has S as a component. Okay, now Quine says the first metalinguistic uh, formulation is completely acceptable. And he says the second one he can live with, but it's a mistake. Moving from A to B is a mistake made by C.I. Lewis. We'll get to that. That has to do with part one here about modal logic being conceived in sin. But notice both A and B are different than C. In this case, C attaches the box not to a sentence, but to part of a sentence. It says that X has a certain feature necessarily namely being greater than nine. So here's the property, being greater than nine. That property is a property that X has in a necessary way. So just to understand the formalism carefully, if we put parentheses around X is greater than nine, we are not understanding the logical form of C properly. That would turn C into something that looked a little bit like B, where the box attaches to a formula. In this case, it would be a formula that has a free variable in it, which, which makes it be a little bit weird. But one way, a natural way to think about a free variable is it's got an implicit quantifier on it. That's not exactly right, but the important thing is C is not to be identified with the parentheses being in the way I just drew them. If you want to put parentheses, you will group the box with the variable. And this is predicating necessity of some property of X's. And that was the one that Klein thought just landed you in inconsistency and incoherence. So let's see why. So first, let's start with the difference between A and B. Klein says A is really the right way to talk. It got converted into B because modal logic was conceived in sin. B tries to put into the object language what is really a metalinguistic point. So A is the metalinguistic point. B tries to convert that into a logic that has a symbol in it. Okay, Quine thus accuses C.I. Lewis of confusing use and mention, trying to build a logic in which we can write B when all he really was justified in doing was asserting A. Now, Quine points this out about Lewis's explicit motive because Lewis introduced this symbol, a fish hook. This is called the fish hook. Um, and he said, we need this symbol because that is too weak. 
And the way he makes this point is by saying that the reader of the latter should be understood in terms of implication. And we need a stronger connective, a fish hook, to express the idea of entailment. Now, Quine says that's just a confusion. The arrow, Quine says, is a sentence forming connective in the object language. While the word implies is a two place relation in the meta language. Okay, now the fact that the symbol, the arrow, is part of the object language shows that when you describe it as the relation of implication between two sentences, when you say something like that, you are speaking in the meta language and your use of the notion of implication or your use of the word implies is really a two-place predicate in the meta language. Quine is exactly right about that. Um, but C.I. Lewis is not the only person who made this mistake and Quine knows that as well. Here's what he writes about Whitehead and Russell. In Whitehead and Russell's exposition and terminology, the distinction between predicate and statement connective is blurred. The notation uh, for the arrow, Whitehead and Russell use the subset symbol, uh, often called the horseshoe. So let's call it the horseshoe. The notation, the horseshoe notation is explained indiscriminately in the sense of the truth functional conditional. Notice that's telling you what the role of this thing is in the object language. So it's, that's one way of describing the horseshoe. The other is in the sense of material implication. And now that's a remark in the meta language about what this thing is doing. So if you use the language of material implication, you are now in the meta language. If you talk about the horseshoe as a truth functional connective, you are explaining its role in the object language. And um, you have to be clear about whether you're using or mentioning a symbol. And Whitehead and Russell were not clear on that. So here's the evidence that Whitehead and Russell were guilty of the same conclusion, confusion, excuse me, that uh, Klein is accusing um, C.I. Lewis of. This is a quote from Russell and Whitehead, but implies as used here, now notice implies is a term in the meta language. It's not part of the object language, but implies as used here expresses nothing else than the connection between P and Q also expressed by the disjunction, not P or Q. All right, now that, that is uh, explaining, that, that's just a mess. If you had said the horseshoe is a connective which doesn't do anything in the object language that isn't also done by the disjunction symbol between not P and Q. You could have said that. Now that's all about stuff in the object language, but this just runs together a term in the meta language with a description of the functional role of the connective that you were supposed to be talking about, the horseshoe, in the object language. Then notice, now let's talk about the symbol itself. The horseshoe employed for P implies Q. No, that's not right. The horseshoe, this is a sentence in the meta language. It is not a sentence in the object language. The symbol employed in the P horseshoe Q formula is just functionally equivalent to not P or Q. And those two are the same. Okay, so keep clear when you're talking about the object language, when you're talking about the functional equivalence in the object language, and when you're making a remark in the meta language. So notice this sentence is guilty of use mentioned confusions because P and Q are sentences in the object language. So this is not a well-formed formula. It is guilty all by itself of a use mentioned confusion. If you want to write this out in the meta language, you can, but what you have to do is put P in quotes and say P 
implies this is so ugly writing, isn't it? I feel like I'm in kindergarten. P implies Q. That formulation, and then if you want to talk about that sentence in the meta language, you put it in either single or double quotes, depending on which um, device you rely on for using rather than mentioning. Okay, so um, that's all fine. And you can think this looks awfully anal retentive, but Quine is exactly right about all of that. Uh, C.I. Lewis confuses use and mention and says things that are technically incorrect. So did Russell and Whitehead. But notice Quine's not gonna look at Russell and Whitehead and say, so all of first order theory has to be thrown out the window because Quine made, I mean, Whitehead and Russell made uh, a glaring mistake. Well, first, it's not glaring. It's rather difficult to see and explain, but you don't throw out the logic because of that. So here's how it shows up in Lewis. We've seen how it shows up in Whitehead and Russell, but Lewis argued that the relation of material implication is too weak to characterize the relation of logical implication or entailment and use that fact to argue for the introduction of a stronger connective. But this argument is confused, since the right thing for Whitehead and Russell to have said was that horseshoe is a connective in the object language, not a relation characterizable in the meta language by talk of material implication between the same things. You can't say anything in the meta language without mentioning the formulas in the object language rather than using them. Fixing Whitehead and Russell in the way Quine is recommending eliminates Lewis's argument for introducing a stronger connective. Now here's the takeaway from this. This is all fine and good. Quine is right, there is a confusion, but just don't even give the explanation Lewis gave. Just say, I'm gonna introduce a new connective. The new connective is gonna be a fishhook. I'm going to define the fishhook in terms of this new device, a box. So we already have an object language that has P horseshoe Q in it, and I'm going to introduce an operator. The operator functions on these sentences so that if you can box the horseshoe, you can drop the box, drop the horseshoe, and replace it with a fish hook. That is, the fish hook formula abbreviates the latter. And then you're going to give various rules for how this box works syntactically. You do that in precisely the same way that you do when you introduce any new symbols into your object language. So when you started your first order logic, the first thing you did was introduce sentence letters, P, Q, R, S, whatever. Second thing, and you said any such sentence is a well-formed formula. So once you have those in place, then you can introduce things like wedges and arrows and ampersands and double arrows and negation symbols. And each time you introduce a symbol, you introduce a clause that tells you how you use that new symbol to generate grammatical sentences from other sentences that you've already granted are grammatical. And you can do the same thing with the box. So you say, if, if you've got a grammatical sentence to start with, then putting a box in front of it also gives you a grammatical sentence, or as logicians call it, a well-formed formula. All right, now you can do all of that. There's no confusion of use and mention in doing it. Um, so Quine's charge that modal logic was conceived in sin is correct, but unimportant. It doesn't undermine modal logic any more than Whitehead and Russell's confusion undermined first order logic. Okay. Now, Quine did not attach that much significance to this objection, but it was just a fun one to say because it's really fun to um, accuse a view of being conceived in sin. It's a beautiful phrase. So it sounded good, needed to be used, so he used it. And then he moved on to something that he thought was more important. So if you go back and look, he said, um, the first one is the one I'm most happy with. And, um, Going from A to B is the move that was made on the basis of confusing use and mention. But as we've just seen, 
that's not a problem. I mean, there is the sin of confusing use and mention, but that doesn't undermine developing a logic where B is perfectly well formed. And Quine knows that, and he granted the point. What he didn't like was going from B to C, where now you attach the box to parts of sentences, namely to predicates. So th this one is not maybe the most, the easiest to understand, uh, but suppose you've got, suppose you've got this sentence, Joe is necessarily, I don't know if this is true about any human beings, but just take the sentence. Suppose you say, look, the particular species that you are isn't just accidentally true of you. It's necessarily true. Okay, now, how do you wish to represent that sentence? Well, J is a name. So if we treat it the way we treat usual predicates and constants in the language, we're going to have H as the predicate is human, and J will refer to Joe. But notice we left out the box. So you're going to put the box. Okay, so now we've got a box, H, J. But remember, there is a difference between the box governing the whole well-formed formula. That's an example that we've already seen in B. But that's not what this is supposed to be. This is supposed to be where the box is grabbing H itself grabbing part of a sentence and not the whole sentence. And so if this is, if it's grabbing part of the sentence, Quine describes that in terms of, I'm gonna write this down, the phrase quantifying in. So Quine says, if you have C, if you have a box functioning in a sentence in the way it functions in C, then you're gonna be able to quantify in. Now, what would it look like to quantify in here? Well, remember, the parentheses are not supposed to be here, but rather grouping the box with the predicate letter. So quantifying in would let us replace J with a variable and write there is an X that has a certain property. What is that property? That property is box H. And once you have that formula in front of you, the temptation to view the box is governing a well-formed formula with the parentheses around H, capital H, small j, is no longer present because the box is now buried behind a quantifier and so has to govern only part of the sentence, namely the predicate. Okay, now that's the part. Quantifying in is what bothers Quine about modal logic because he thinks it leads to incoherence. Here's why. He's worried that this puts, as he says, it puts necessity in things rather than in words. So if you, if you think Joe is necessarily human, then you've put necessity into Joe and his humanity, not just in the words that we use to describe Joe, right? Now, the way to think about that is, is necessity in the world or does it derive from something like analyticity, a philosophy of language distinction? Quine is firmly committed to the standard empiricist line that necessity follows analyticity. And that's the only understanding of necessity that we can have that makes any sense at all. Okay, now what's the argument? Here's his example. Let S be a human cyclist. Human cyclist. Let it be Carl Craver, for example. He's both human and a cyclist. Humans are essentially rational and cyclists are essentially bipedal. Now I'm gonna stop there because neither of those claims uh, is likely to withstand scrutiny. Uh, take the thing about cyclists. I want you to grant the point, um, but 
um, know that there are problems here. Um, one of the things, if, you, if you're if you a really good cyclist and you hire a coach to prepare you for Olympic cycling events, one of the things they're worried about is how circular your pedaling motion is. And so what they do to get you to pedal uh, more evenly around the entire circle that the pedal travels is they remove one of the pedals and make you ride around just pedaling with one foot. Well, presumably you could do that if you had been born uh, without one of your legs or if you'd lost one of your legs in a war or something like that. So to say that cyclists are essentially bipedal is pretty clearly false. You can be a cyclist without two feet. Um, how about humans being essentially rational? Uh, well, this is murky because who knows what the rationality function is, but just think about birth defects and the ways in which some infants, sadly, are born with no mental capacities at all and they will never develop any. Are they human? That's hard to deny. And they're clearly not rational. So maybe humans aren't essentially rational either. So maybe both of these claims are false, but you can get a good sense of what Klein's worried about by just granting the point. So humans are essentially rational. Cyclists are essentially bipedal. Let that claim go. They're not really true, but they're close to being true or closer than denying it. And certainly closer than the next set of sentences. Humans are not essentially bipedal. The rationality claim has much more going for it than the bipedal claim has going for it when you're talking about human beings. That's his point. And cyclists are not essentially rational by the same assumption, right? If you think about a cyclist, you're much closer to the notion of being bipedal than you are being rational. So think about being at a circus where you see a bear riding a bicycle, much closer to needing two feet than needing to be rational because I hear bears aren't rational. In any case, grant both of these claims, even though all of these claims that the non-essential claims are clearly true. Uh, the claims about what's essential are not true, but you're closer to these points than you are. You're closer to being right when you say humans are essentially rational than you would be if you said humans are essentially bipedal. So let's just go with the exaggerated claims. And here's what Quine concludes. S is both essentially rational and not essentially rational and both essentially bipedal and not essentially bipedal, since S is a human cyclist. That's a contradiction, he says. So necessity ride resides in words, not in things. So you can get the necessity of rationality when you describe S as a human, but you can't get the necessity of being bipedal when you describe the individual as a human. All right, now here's how you can think about this. So we have S who is both a human and a cyclist. And then necessity will arise at the level of sentences when you describe S in terms of being a human, you'll be able to get to rationality. All right, so that one will be necessary. If you describe S as a human, you're not going to get to bipedal. That one won't be necessary. On the other hand, if you describe S as a cyclist, you're going to find some more necessity. You're going to get a necessary implication to being bipedal. So both of those will be necessary given those descriptions. Now notice, if you recall from um, Russell's 1905 paper, the issue of scope is super important in, um, in logic in general. And if you get confused about where the connective or the logical element is to be put, you will make goofy mistakes. So think about uh, the Shakespeare quote, all that glitters is not gold. Now it looks like the negation is buried on the backside of the sentence. And so 
you might be tempted to put the negation on the last predicate. So you'd say for all x, if x is gold, then x doesn't glitter. Oops, I did it wrong. You might be tempted to put it on gold. You might say for all x, if x glitters, then x is not gold. That's to give the negation a narrow scope reading. And that's clearly not what Shakespeare intended, right? Because he knows that there's some gold that glitters. What it's supposed to be is a warning about not being deceived by appearances. And for that, you have to put the negation outside the entire sentence. You have to give it wide scope. So you have to say, it's not the case that for all x, if x glitters, then x is gold. That's the wide scope reading. That's the one Shakespeare intended. The sentence itself is ambiguous between the two readings. OK, same thing going on here, because remember what's special about the third use of the language of necessity was that it attached to parts of sentences. So Klein here is saying, look, once you do that, you're going to land yourself in the domain of contradictions. The only way you're going to ever be able to make sense out of these boxes is when you leave them in wide scope position. Then you get some truths, perhaps, but you don't, you, you just get contradictions when you try to put them on predicates or parts of sentences. So this came to be called the de dicto reading of necessity. Uh, Latin dictum means sentence. So it means necessity predicated of the sentence. Whereas the third grade of modal involvement predicated necessity of things. So if you have the operator on just a part of a sentence, that came to be called the de re reading. Now, um, the discussion of de re versus de dicto became much more complicated than that. But for right now, we're just going to treat the distinction as a scope distinction a scope distinction about where the box uh, and the diamond similarly, whether the box has wide scope or narrow scope. So we're gonna treat it just as a scope distinction here. And what I want you to see is, this is an example of one of the most famous fallacies in the history of thinking about modal logic. So um, look at the sentence. Now suppose, um, suppose we try to, I mean, we're really supposed to be thinking about de re modality and we're supposed to get a contradiction when we think about that. So let me pull up the, pull up the annotator again. So we've got S, this is going to be a Carl Craver or pick whoever you're most famous uh, cyclist is in the philosophy department at WashU. Okay. Now, is S necessarily rational? Where we understand the box to attach to the predicate tightly and not to govern the whole sentence. Does S have the property of being box R? Um, well, S is human, but that's not enough. If it turns out S is essentially human, then if humans are essentially rational, Yes, S is also essentially rational. But suppose S is not essentially a human, is a human, but not essentially a human. Now, that's a hard thing to think about. Could you have been something other than a human being? Well, some of you are going to be inclined to say no. And that's okay. If you're inclined to say no, um, I'm a bit inclined that way too, but remember, think about um, alternative metaphysical viewpoints on things in the world. Think about religions, for example, that discuss or are committed to the possibility of reincarnation. Some of them think um, 
I mean, if, if you're Shirley MacLaine kind of reincarnation theorist uh, and you do past life regressions, it turns out you're always some famous French aristocrat back in the 1700s in a prior life. Um, I, at least I've never seen past life regressions that didn't have you with some illustrious uh, person in your background. But if you think about other sorts of um, views of reincarnation that are generated by a strong doctrine of karma or something like that, it turns out um, maybe in past lives you were an earthworm or you were a bear or you were an ape or if you don't start behaving yourself in your next life, you're going to be something. You're going to be a fly on the wall or something like that. All right, now, in those cases, you are a human being, but you clearly are not essentially a human being. In fact, it's not a mere possibility. It looks like, really, as a matter of fact, for part of your total life story, you are a human for part of it and not a human for other parts of it. All right, now, if you have a view like that, you don't have to have that particular reincarnation view to deny that being human is essential to us. Um, but that gives you one way of loosening the grip of the idea that you couldn't be anything other than a human. Um, by the way, there are various Native American metaphysical views that um, imply the same thing. Um, so people turn into wolves, they turn into eagles, they fly away from danger, things like that. Those are parts of certain Plains Indian metaphysical views. And clearly, on those views, you're not essentially human. Okay, and if you're not essentially human, then maybe you're also not essentially rational. Although, you might still be, right? If you, if you take these um, Native American mythologies seriously, where people turn into eagles or wolves to escape danger, Maybe you just become a rational wolf or a rational eagle. Maybe you don't lose your rationality in the process of losing your humanity, but at least you won't have this explanation to ground the claim that you're essentially rational. All right, so let's let that one go and think, all right, maybe you are essentially rational, maybe you're not. What about the second one? Is Carl essentially bipedal? Of course not. Because the only way you could get that he's essentially bipedal, what that means, by the way, is go to any possible world in which you find S. There will be no possible world in which S exists and lacks the property in question. And of course, Carl is not essentially bipedal. Why? Because Carl is obviously not essentially a cyclist. That's a contingent feature of S, no matter what you think about whether humanity is essential to S. Clearly, being a cyclist is not essential to anybody. But notice the conclusion that Quine aims for. He wants there to be some pair of predicates that we attach to S that look like this. S has this box X predicate and X lacks this box X predicate. But you can't get that unless S is essentially bipedal in virtue of being a cyclist, and that's just clearly false. Now, this fallacy was well known in medieval philosophy. It's called, I believe, in Aquinas. He, I, I'm not sure he's the first one to name it this, but he called it the fallacy of, of, of confusing the necessity of the consequence, Q-U-E-N-C-E -E at the end, with the necessity of the consequent, Q-U-E-N-T. Now, if you think about, let me clear my drawings, that fallacy is, here's what the necessity of the consequence looks like. The box governs a formula which is an arrow formula and expresses a consequence relation between X and Y. That's the necessity of the consequence. What would the necessity of the consequent look like? Well, that's where the box 
is placed on the consequent of the conditional. So if you say, Carl is necessarily rational, maybe what you're saying is the necessity of the consequent. If you're Carl, then you are essentially rational. That's this reading. Or you might say it's a necessary truth that if you're Carl, then you're rational. Or if you wish, let's use humans. You may say it's a necessary truth that if you're human, then you're rational. Or you might say if you're human, then you're essentially rational. In order to get the contradiction that Klein is after, you have to read everything in the De Re reading or the necessity of the consequent reading. So this is a well-known fallacy in medieval philosophy, metaphysics, and logic, um, and isn't, wasn't generally recognized by a group of, group of people that viewed medieval philosophy as uh, just a bunch of people doing philosophical theology that wasn't any, of any interest to people anymore. Okay, so Quine has a worry, but it's a completely misplaced worry. So that's his second one. Um, third complaint that uh, Marcus talks about from Quine is that Quine thinks contingent identity is going to have to be disallowed if you're going to do modal metaphysics. Now, I'm going to show you, when we turn to Kripke, I'll show you why he's worried about this, because there's a very simple proof that identity can't be contingent that Kripke gives us. But Kripke didn't invent this um, argument. He was It's not original with him. It was well known. Ruth Barker Marcus knew about it. So suppose you think this is true. X is identical with Y, if and only if necessarily X is identical with Y. Klein says, oh, that's just, that's really bad. You're just purifying the universe. So here's some examples of contingent identities. The morning star is the evening star. Scott is the author of Waverly. And notice we're using the symbol for identity here. And um, Marcus says, I don't think either of these strictly count as identity statements which of course is what you should say if you're already committed to the um, necessity of identity, you should say, where'd you get the idea that that means identity? Why do you think that means identity? You will have to question that. Here's what Ruth says about it. She says, look, um, she's thinking about necessity and contingency as deriving from analyticity. So she says, let's just talk about tautologies. Tautologies are necessary. And if P is a tautology and P is logically equivalent to Q, then Q is a tautology as well. So once you start realizing that, you're going to see that one is not troubling. But you still have to say something about why these sentences are not strictly identity claims. And she does that as well. She says, it is my opinion that the identity relation need not be introduced for anything other than the entities we countenance as things, such as individuals. All right, now, Scott is a thing, an individual. The author of Waverly is not a thing. It's a depiction of an individual. So think, just think about um, Russell's theory and on denoting. Marcus is embracing what Russell did in on denoting. And it's rather surprising that Klein doesn't think of this move. But the idea is, this is, if there is an identity symbol to be found in here, it's not an identity symbol that attaches this description or the thing denoted by these descriptions to each other because that would just be x equals x, and nobody, nobody thinks x equals x is contingent. So Quine says you're trying to purify the universe, but apparently he forgot to think about Russell, the Russell maneuver, and Ruth Mark and Marcus says, uh, yeah, think about the way Russell treated those sentences. Those sentences may have an identity symbol in them, but it's not an identity flanked by the two um, linguistic expressions that you're using. Only one of those will count as 
a suitable value for anything that we'll put in an identity claim. Okay, so we'll go back to the necessity of identity claim when we get to Kripke. Um, and notice what I said earlier, she's thinking of necessity as following on analyticity. So you start with a philosophy of language distinction, you identify the analytic claims, which you describe in terms of being a tautology, and then the necessary claims are just gonna be the analytic ones. Okay, now the most interesting thing of all in Ruth Barkin Marcus's work is are called these Barkin formulas. So there's, this is a Barkin formula and there is related to it a converse Barkin formula. And what I want you to notice is the placement of the modal operator. In the Barkin formula, it, the antecedent here has the diamond in wide scope position and on the consequent, it takes narrow scope. So think about this in terms of possible worlds. It's possible that there exists something X that has a certain feature A. That entails that there is something that has this possible characteristic. I believe I've talked about my possible third child. I have two children. I could have had one more, could have had several more, but let's talk about my possible third child. So I say it's possible that there is an X that is my third child. That sounds true, but does this sound true? There is something in the universe as it actually is that has this feature being my possible third child. That just doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right at all. All right, you can think of the same thing with the converse Barkin formula, which says if there exists something that is possibly A, then it's possible that there exists something that's A. And for my third child, look, if there really is a being in the universe who is my possible third child, then of course it's possible that there is something that is my third child. So you think, oh, converse Barkin formula is fine. But look at the footnote. Um, this is not as innocuous as it sounds. Um, Marcus, in the paper you read, ignores the converse Barkin formula, and it's not surprising that she does. But it becomes controversial later on when it's combined with certain forms of actualism. So think about actualism. Actualism says the only things that exist are actual things. Everything that's true is a function of things that actually exist. Okay, so think of three views here. Actualism is something about um, other possible worlds not existing. Only this world really exists. That's like presentism in the philosophy of time. Presentism in the philosophy of time says the only time that is strictly real, really truly real is the present time. The future is not yet. The past is already gone. All we have is the present. So call that presentism. And now compare actualism and presentism with the spatial analog. The spatial analog of presentism would say the only point, spatial point that's real is here. Other spatial points do not have the same reality as here. So there is not really real. Only here is real. Now, I expect nobody you've ever met is a defender of hereism. It doesn't sound plausible at all. Here is just one among many spatial points, all of which are equally real. But presentism is not as absurd as hereism. In fact, it sounds like a truth. The present is what's truly real. The past and future are not. Past used to be real, is no longer. Future will be real, but is not yet real. Okay, actualism says logical space is like time. Only where we are is truly real. The other points that we talk about 
would have to be talked about in terms of some feature of what is real. So call that actualism. All right, now here's one application of actualism when you're talking about the converse Markin formula. Use the predicate in question to be the predicate of being actual. If you start with a converse Markin formula and go in this direction, you can turn it around by negating the consequent and negating the antecedent. And if you take the negation of the consequent and you let A be the property of being actual, you end up with the antecedent of something that says, it's a necessary truth that everything is actual. And then converse Markin will say, if it's a necessary truth that everything is actual, then everything is necessarily actual. All right, now the actualist is pretty clearly committed to this antecedent. It is a necessary truth that everything is actual because all the other possibilities are not truly real. There are no things other than the actual things. So it is a necessary truth that everything is actual. All right. What follows from that by converse Markin is that everything is necessarily actual. So that means there is no world that's a possible world where you don't exist if you're an actual thing. So actualists are committed to the truth of the antecedent here. So they're committed to the claim that everything has the essential property of being actual that nothing can possibly fail to exist, and thus there are no contingent beings. Converse Markin formula commits you to that conclusion. Now, Marcus didn't notice that and didn't worry about it, and we're about to see why. She uses a version of a model theory for quantified modal logic that endorses such a claim, and we'll see why. When you do quantified modal, when you do a model theory for quantified modal logic, you have a choice about whether you're going to use a fixed domain semantics or a variable domain semantics. In first order logic, we use a fixed domain semantics. It's the same domain for every formula and every model. Um, well, it's the same domain for every model that you construct. And Marcus's defense of quantified modal logic, as, as we'll see, wants to use that. In fact, that's how she ends up endorsing this. So if you remember when I talked about my possible third child. It's possible that I had a third child, but I don't actually think there's anything that is my possible third child. I reject the Barkin formula, and I think you should too, and here's why. You look at the things that exist in the actual world, and you say, well, there's a possibility left open by the nature of reality, and that's that I have a possible third child. So the actual world is not a world that realizes that possibility. We will have to go to some other world. So the actual world, I don't have a possible third child, but since it's possible, there has to be some other world that realizes that possibility. But there's no reason to assume that the same objects exist in this world as exist here. So when I get to this world and find my possible third child, it doesn't have to be an individual that was also up in this world. You can have one set of objects for this world, a different set of objects for this world, and then there's some new stuff down in this world, and one of them is my third child in that world. Okay, now notice that commits you to a variable domain semantics. VDS. All right, if you have a fixed domain semantics, then if there is a possibility claim in this world, and I don't have a third child in this world, I have to go to another world where I find a possible third child, but that individual who is my third child in that world will also have to be up in this world because the domain doesn't vary between worlds. That's what uh, Ruth Markin Marcus is assuming about worlds. And that's what she assumes when she gives her defense of the Barkin formulas. 
So we'll conclude by noting what she says about that. She says, consider, for example, a language L with truth functional connectives, a modal operator, a finite number of individual constants, an infinite number of individual variables, one two-place relation R, quantification, and the usual criteria for being well-formed. And OK, all of that is just the syntax of the language. So we've now got a language in front of us. Then turn to semantics. A domain D of individuals is then considered, which are named by the constants of the language. So you assign to each constant in the language some member of this domain D, all standard first order logic there. A model is then defined as a class of ordered couples of D. The members of a model are exactly those pairs between which R holds. If A is diamond B, then A is true in M if and only if B is true in some model M sub one. So all she's doing is using sentence letters M and M sub one, where I used circles, right? So she says, we're gonna have a domain D. And then we're gonna have models So the model, if we've got R, the model will tell you which ordered pairs satisfy R, right? Now, we've also got another predicate, which she didn't mention before, but this predicate possibly be whatever, whatever B happens to be. Maybe it's diamond R, but it doesn't matter. If you've got possibly B, then you will pick out some members of the domain that have this feature. If B is a one place predicate, you'll just pick out a subset of D. If B is a relation, um, and given that the only predicate we have in this language is R, it would seem B has to be the same thing as R. Um, well, for R, you pick out ordered pairs on the domain because a relation has two empty slots in it. All right, and if you, if you assign to R or as we're calling it now, B, if you assign to B ordered pairs on the domain, you'll also assign to diamond B ordered pairs on the domain, which might be the same as what you assign to B, but need not be the same. All right, if they're not the same, then you're claiming, well, this is just a possibility. Possibilities have to be realized in other possible worlds, or as she puts it, in other models. So if we get diamond B, true in M, we have to get B to be true in some other world, M1. So the, ordered, the, the set of ordered pairs we assigned to diamond B in this model will have to be assigned to B in this model. That's the only thing she's saying. Now note the assumption, what stays fixed? in all of this discussion? The answer is the domain stays fixed. This is precisely a fixed domain semantics. It leaves no room for talking about things that exist in this model or possible world that don't exist in this model or possible world. And if that's the kind of semantics you have in mind, if that's what you are assuming, then of course you're gonna like the Barkin formula because if you can't find anything in this world that is my possible third child, then it's simply not possible that I have a third child. So if it's possible, there has to be something that has that feature. Something in the actual domain is assigned to this formula, and then that very thing will have to be assigned that property as well. So her defense of the Barkin formulas, which turn out to be quite controversial, both Barkin formula, both the Barkin formula, and the converse Barkin formula look like bad modal metaphysics, but they're perfectly adequate claims about modal space on the assumption that your domain is fixed. That assumption will be given up when we see Kripke's semantics. So for right now, if you like the fixed domain semantics, you're gonna be stuck with the existence of everything being necessary. And even though I'm 
uh, being rather disparaging about that view, the fact is it has been defended recently. Tim Williamson in his book, uh, Modal Logic as Metaphysics, uh, published in 2013, defends precisely this point of view. I think I've mentioned that before. In any case, enough about Ruth and her impressive work in modal metaphysics. The real culmination of the end of analytic philosophy together with the rise of modal metaphysics occurs in Kripke, both in his publishing of the semantics for quantified modal logic in 1962, but most importantly, his lectures that we're going to talk about, read and talk about in the next lecture. <laughs>